Life Audio. Hello, welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we discuss powerful truths to counter anxiety and fear, big and small. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and experience soul, deep, emotional, and spiritual freedom, and we want to inspire you to share that freedom with others. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn about one of our upcoming events, how to book one of our speakers for your next event, or simply how to connect with us. I'm Jennifer Slattery, and while I wouldn't necessarily call myself change adverse, I must admit major transitions can leave me feeling unsettled and insecure. I'm not sure what I find more difficult, the releasing of something old or the embracing of the new. Each affect me for different reasons, and both reveal the depth of my trust and security and reliance upon God. In today's episode, which is the first in a two-part series, we'll discuss the grief and anxiety that can come when God removes us from a particular role or assignment. Next week, we'll dig into those seasons when God calls us to embrace something new. Today, I've invited Teresa Bombach, a member of the Holy Love Ministry team, to join us. Teresa, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Teresa is a gifted teacher who's taught high school and college English and writing and served on staff at one of the largest churches in Omaha, Nebraska, during which she helped with numerous projects and publications. She currently leads Holy Love's content development team and is transitioning to soon take over as ministry president. She has a heart for women and desires to help others grow in their walk with God by sharing her experiences, insights, and challenges. She also participates in and leads Bible studies regularly. She's been married to her husband, Bill, for 38 years. They have one daughter, Sarah, and a granddaughter, Julietta. I love that name, Julietta. (laughs) She's a sweetie. You love her, too. Teresa, I find it interesting how closely our lives seem to parallel, especially in regard to today's topic. I don't know about you, but I can easily allow my sense of identity to become entangled in a particular role or a series of achievements, which can lead to increased insecurity when God shifts my direction. And I might feel like I've lost who I am, which then reveals that I bought into the lie that I don't have intrinsic worth, and instead that my value depends on my title, my actions, or achievements. Have you ever struggled with similar issues? Well, it happens all the time. I think more often than we like to admit in our own lives. For me, it's happened frequently because I've moved a lot with my husband and so what and his work. So what I found is change isn't ever easy. This transition, this letting go is never easy, even if it's something I've chosen. Like if I wanted, most recently we moved back to Vancouver, Washington. We wanted to be closer to family. It didn't make the change any easier. It's hard to leave a place where I've been known, where I am valued, where I have a role, where I know what my purpose is. And when I leave and I move, I have to start all over again. And I've done it probably at least eight, if not 10 times in my adult life. And then looking back in my childhood, I, my parents moved just a lot too. So I, I've experienced this frequently throughout my life and it's hard. And in fact, it was so bad that when I moved to Phoenix, I told my husband I was not going to hang any pictures on the walls and I wasn't going to make any friends because we were going to just move again in a couple of years. I had a terrible attitude. Thankfully, the Lord led me to a ministry called Just Move for women who were uprooted mostly from moves. And I did make some friends. I got involved with church. I got involved with ministry. I did put pictures on the walls. (laughs) Uh, And I did find my place and purpose there and my friends there. And so when I had to leave, and let go again, it was still really hard. So when I go to a new place and I feel unknown, I feel unseen, it's easy to believe the lie that I don't have value, that I don't have an identity. But then God reminds me, he whispers in my ear that he loves me, that I'm his child. So I'm a child of God. I have an identity no matter where I am or if not another soul knows me. And that he 
is there for me. I'm a daughter of a king. I can go to the throne room anytime I want. You know, think about, I have a grandchild. I'm more gracious with her than I was with my daughter. But, you know, she can run in and I will stop anything. We can run into God's throne room and he will stop and just say he loves us. It will all be well. He sees us. He's a good father and he provides all that I need. And so I still struggle with wanting to be known and wanting to have purpose. But if I can just breathe and rest in my identity in Christ, my identity that my father loves me, then I'm okay. I like to, I do best if I view my life from a lens, not just what God maybe is doing through me, but what he's doing in me. And I'm, I try to remind myself, he's always, always, always leading me to increased healing and freedom. Mm-hmm. And so I'm one, I'm curious when those transitions, and I know you recently went through like moving. Mm-hmm. So you were on church staff and a thriving yes. ministry and then moving to Vancouver. Did that process, has that process actually encouraged you to recognize more and hold tight to who you are in Christ? It, it has in a way that has surprised me or might seem unexpected, but if we know the character of God, probably not. I have practiced and become better, and it's just not instantaneous in my walk, to listen to the Holy Spirit and what he thoughts, impressions in my time with God in the morning. And, you know, those hard seasons, we do have to kind of press in more. But I heard God say, it'll be okay, and I have something new. So we left this large, thriving church in Omaha, and I was seeking the same thing in Vancouver. And yet we went to two bigger churches and yet they weren't the right fit. And there's a small church close by our home. And so we went to it. Somebody else had recommended it. And I thought, this is a tiny church and I'm not so sure about it. And it actually was in transition itself from a a former lead pastor had left. They have an interim pastor. And I'm like, what am I doing? Going to a church that's in flux. I'm in flux. This is not stable. I need to leave. And yet I could palpably feel the power of the Holy Spirit in the body. And God just in a fleeting moment on a lesson driving home from church said, a church isn't about the pastor, it's about the body. And this body is a spirit-filled body and you need to be here. I'm like, okay. Wow. And so I think it's in those times as I've learned to be obedient, and that's a word people don't like today, but it's a, a lesson the Lord has taught me in the last couple of years, also practice. The more I practice, the easier it becomes. The same with listening, the easier it becomes. Is, is that God has something that we don't expect in the new. And that's a good growth thing, that God is a God of surprises. And those surprises are good and joy-filled. And what's interesting is in a smaller church, we've become known faster. Wow. So I've only lived there six months and been at this church for six months but I've already been called upon to help in different ways. It t- it usually takes one to two years in a new community. And because I was said yes to God saying, you need to be here, we're known and we're already plugged in much faster than it's been with any other move. Yeah. Well, I love listening to your story. I hear, how long have you been walking with Christ, following Jesus? Well, it depends. I grew up in a, in a faith-based home. Okay. So it's easy to say my whole life um, in the church I was raised in, we had confirmation in eighth grade. It tends to be the time churches baptize new believers. We take our faith for ourselves. So that would probably be the time and the season. But I also became an alcoholic in my adult life and I had to find a new relationship with God, with Jesus, with the father, with all of that would, that would serve me in my life. So I guess it's, been since I was born, but ever changing, ever drawing nearer, growing deeper in various ways. Well, when you were sharing your story, I heard a lot of trust mm-hmm. that you have developed in Christ. Like I, I heard you say, you know, God's got something new. You So it's like you had this foundation. You'd, you'd come to know God in a more personal, intimate way. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you were more able to trust his guidance, it sounded like. And coming to him with this trust, like with a heart that was open, then made it easier, it sounded like, to hear his guidance and to follow. Like you developed this this relationship. And I think that's the beauty of transitions yes. as well. And when, and when you're talking, I was thinking of Paul. Mm-hmm. So first century church planter. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. And there, there's one section in scripture. It's actually in Acts 16, where... 
he wants to go to Asia and we don't really know why. I, I would love to know why he was mm -hmm. wanting to go there, but that was what his desire was. And then God redirected him a couple times. And I, I wonder if I had been Paul in that redirection, if I wanted to go in a particular way, maybe to a certain ministry, and I kept feeling like this door is closed. I'm wondering, would I pivot and trust? Mm. Would I keep trying to push on a door that, that God was like, no, this is, this is not for you? I'm not sure how I would have responded. Well, I think our nature, our human nature is I'm just going to, and I'm, you know, a very self-motivated person. I'm just going to push forward. I may or may not ask if God's will is in this or not. That has been my previous character, right? And over time and with wisdom, it tends to backfire on me. And and he's because God is gracious, and he's like, sure, you can do this. You you know, kind of like we let our child, sure, if you want to eat that thing, but you're going to have a stomach ache. You know, he lets us do that and reap the consequences, and then go, oh, you were right. You know, or what do you want for me? So I hope to shortcut that now and just not try to bullhead my way <laughs> into something, and just go, okay, you know, what do you have for me? So. Even in trying to say, yes, what doors are open, what doors are closed. When I moved to Washington, I wanted to, I'm a teacher by training. I'm an English teacher and I love teaching both English and scripture and all different types of things. And, and I thought, well, I want to go back into education or I loved my work at the church, maybe I could work at the church. I applied for different positions and all those doors closed. And it was hard. Painful, I bet. And painful because I'm like, oh Lord, you put a desire in me to work, to use the gifts you've blessed me with. And I'm just sitting at home. Now, I'm not just sitting at home. Part of our move involves uh, watching our six-year-old granddaughter three days a week when my daughter works nights at the Nick Which is a holy, holy Which assignment. is a holy ministry. Yes. And it's a big thing, but we devalue, I think, yes. those relationships God puts in our lives to yes. pour into. No, I want a bigger kingdom impact, you know, or I want right. a bigger purpose, or I want a paycheck, right. <laughs> or something that says I have value. Well, how can just being Nana to this child who loves me unconditionally somehow be part of God's <laughs> work? I just, you know, it's so easy for us to twist. Mm-hmm what the world says we should be compared right. to what God right. says we should. So there's a wrestling in those right. times that we do. And so God was closing doors kind of like he did for Paul in Acts 16. It's like, no, we tried to go this way. No, we tried to right. go this right. way. No. And then when they finally rested, God gave Paul the vision to say, you're going to go to Macedonia. You know, for me, it was more, Lord, you need to change my heart so that I'm content with being Nana. You know, and even when we went to the bank to set up new bank accounts and my husband and his role and his work, then me and I'm like, well, I was a teacher by training, but I'm not teaching. Oh, so you're a homemaker. I said, no, I'm Nana. Can we just put, my job is Nana in the box. It. So that I could be content yeah. with where God had called me in that season. Right. And I right. think in that letting go, we have to be willing to just say, I need to be okay with where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Because... And there was something in the back of my mind, and I looked back on my journals, and I had a sense that God had something for me, but it wasn't yet. Like, he was working on something. Right. And I could be okay with that. Right. He was working on my heart. Which yes, that <laughs> was it. Which for what you were it. stepping into. But you yeah. didn't know it, and I didn't know it. Right, 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 right. It, but I love His that perfect timing, that. too. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you talked about, so Paul... All the doors, like, don't go here, don't go here, don't go here. And then he sees a vision of Macedonia. You've referenced how God had something ahead. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm reminded he always has good for yes. us ahead. But I, I'm particularly, so those who are familiar with the story. So he goes to Macedonia. He plants the first church in ancient Europe. And it's the church of in Philippi, mm -hmm. which become, from what I understand, the people he becomes closest with, like the only yes. church in scripture we see that he actually received money from. And so it just seems like he had this precious connection through that. And I often wonder what if he kept pushing mm -hmm. in Asia, God had this beautiful gift that actually when Paul was in really in need, in need, and he was able to say, I love you with the love of Christ and, and receive support and encouragement from them. So again, I want to go back to, we have a good, loving, faithful father. Yes. 
Yes. When one of the things, and I bring it up and I think about all the moves that I had, and each time there's a new move or a letting go or a different transition, a verse or a section of scripture that I love is 2 Chronicles 20. So even it's though it's in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. it's a situation in which King Jehoshaphat is going to go into war and he's trying to give like this pep talk to the people. And he's saying a prayer at the same time. But there's really three parts to it. And in this is the answer to kind of where we're at, which is one, are you not? Like, are you not the God of all creation? So I have to remember who God is. God is big and great. His vision is so much greater and grander than mine. So, and he has good things in store for me. So I remember that. And then the second part is, did you not? So in the past, how many times did God show up for me? Every time I've moved. Every time I've let go, every time I've gone from one job or career to another, God has provided and been faithful. So can I go back and remember his faithfulness? So will he not? So then the third, into the future. He will because he has before. And I park on that. So sometimes when we're in that time of waiting and that time of discernment, I remember God, who he is, what he has done for me in the past, and I believe he will again. And then the really wonderful part in that scripture is that God says, stand firm and I will fight for you. So we're not even called upon, we're called to be ready, but we may or may not even do the work. And I think that's so true when we feel like we've had to let go or we have this radical change and it feels uncomfortable and am I going to get lost in this somehow to remember the character of God, that he is wonderful and mighty. He created the universe and he's done such good for me in the past. And he will again, if I will just walk in that trust is a, is a big thing. I've learned that he's trustworthy. I've learned that he is good. He's not going to give me a serpent or a spider when I ask for bread, right? That's in the New Testament. So to remember who he is and then who I am because I'm his child. Right. Well, for me, when I am struggling to follow God's leading, it lets me know that there's maybe a little crack in my faith foundation, Mm -hmm. or maybe there's some doubt in my relationship with God, that then it's an opportunity for me to go deeper. And often for me, because as I've shared on this podcast before, I'm going to be in therapy till the day I die, probably. (laughs) (laughs) So often for me, there's a thread. Mm -hmm. Like what message did I receive in all my previous years, what wounding have I adapted to in an unhealthy way that is impact, making it really hard to just be with Jesus? Just to say, you know what, I am enough in, and we always have to say in Christ, right? Because we, we need to be in Christ to experience all of these things. But I'm also reminded when you're talking about your journey and then we were talking about Paul, one thing that I think really resonated with Paul's story is he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he also said, I've been crucified with Christ Mm -hmm. and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And when when I think about, so just speaking of transitions, Paul, before he became a Christ follower, he was pretty prestigious in church, right? And, yes. he, and, and he gave up his prestige, a lifetime pursuit of wisdom and knowledge and facts. And he had to let all that go. But what I read in these passages, he said, that to me is nothing compared to this intimacy mm-hmm. that I receive from Jesus Christ when I'm just walking in him. And I'm reminded, so often I want answers, right? I want yes. directions and solutions. And God just wants me. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, well, we were looking for the flashing billboard. It's the quiet voice that says, just sit with me. You know, can we just sit and have some time together? Because I love you and I just need you to know that. And if we sit and have some time together, then you can go on your merry way. But we just, can you be grounded in me? Can you be grounded in my love? That love that Christ has, that there was nothing he didn't do to gain us. And so why wouldn't we want to give up everything to gain Christ? Yeah, and I think that's when we really hear him more clearly. You said just be, right? Mm-hmm. As we spend time with him, we learn to recognize his voice. But I think there's something even more beautiful that occurs is that we can begin to, like I, I say this prayer, not every day, but I would like to say it every day. Is Lord, take away my thoughts and give me your thoughts. Take mm-hmm. away my will and give me your will. Yeah. And then I trust if I am praying that, then he's going to lead. And I I think me transitioning in the ministry is a good example. I noticed that I quit having the the vision, the the driving, the driving vision. Mm -hmm. 
And to me, that was, well, because scripture says that he gives us the desire, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he gives us the desire to do his will if we're, if we're walking with him. Yes. And so I think we can, there's safety in, there's comfort in knowing I don't have to have it all figured out and it's okay if I quote unquote hear him wrong. Yes. Well, and I, we had an opportunity one time in one of my husband's many job moves, he applied for, as you do, more than one job at a time. And we had two job opportunities given to us on the same day, which just was God's orchestration anyway. And when we prayed about it, because we're always wondering what God wants, you know, and just to walk in that. And we heard God say, I will bless you whichever way you choose. Okay. So I believe if we think about the nature of God, that sometimes he'll bless us either way. Right. Other times there's clear blessings or consequences. <laughs> but sometimes right. I think we do get choice. We do have free will and it's not as if all is lost. There's no choosing wrong. Right. And as a someone was talking with me this past week about her own journey and thinking about my journey, that it's curved and twisted, right. but yet been on a linear, straight trajectory to God, to relationship, to where God wants me to be. But sometimes it's a pretty curvy road that got me there. Right. But I still was moving in that direction. Right. I think that God works that way a lot too. And that there's pieces and lessons that I must pick up along right. the way. Right. To prepare me for the thing he has ahead that I don't even know. Right. Like this. Right. 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 <laughs> and for me too, one of my biggest wrestlings is I, I'm a very prideful person. And when my pride gets engaged, then God's voice becomes confused. And yes. so my pride will cause me to be defensive. It'll cause me to seek prestige or achievement or, or any of those things. I love an example given by David, ancient Israel's second king. And he demonstrated, well, he had a, a pretty big mess up at one point, but most of the time he demonstrated yes. a heart led by God. And, and I love a prayer he prayed in Psalm 139. So this is verses 23 to 24. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And as I was really kind of processing through that passage and thinking of your story as well, the whole scripture prior, verses 1 through 22, yes. he's like, you know me, you know when I sit, when I... So this heart posture really came from his deep place of trust and security in the goodness of God. Yes, yes. And I, it's hard to know why people, it can be easy for us to think or believe the lies of the world that say, God doesn't really love you. God doesn't really care about you. And I don't know. Well, I know that it's not true. I think he knows our hearts and he knows what's best for us. And he, he loves us intimately. So why would he be not wanting things that are good and rich and wonderful? And so sometimes he says, open up your hands. Don't cling so tightly. Let go and trust me. And it's all worth it. And yet a key thing I can't let us finish talking about letting go and not talk about how grief is a part of right, letting go. Right. It's not all roses. Right. It's not all easy. It's sad and it's hard and it's painful. And sometimes people will say, but I want this thing, you know, whether it's leaving home and getting married or whether it's moving to a new place, a new job, having a child, whatever the thing is that's changing, you're letting go of something. And if we don't walk through a process of grief, of just embracing that and allowing ourselves to feel sad, we can't really move forward because we have to grieve the goodness of what we had, those people, that job, those things, the parts that God blessed us in where we were if we don't grieve that, one, we can't honor where we came from, but I don't know that I'm healthy enough to fully move forward. So while it's a hard season, it's an important season. And, and I think sometimes people are like, well, I've grieved long enough. There's no timetable on that. And I also just, we, we have to give ourselves grace to grieve. Grace, because then it helps me let go. I love that. And I, I'm thinking just all the work that God does in us through that, even in the grief, I think there can be him really holding us closely. And I'm reminded of an article it was written by 
David Kaywood on the Gospel Coalition, and he said, quote, seasons of transition are educational because they reveal the degree to which our source of joy comes from comfort and not from God. And so there's mm. there's natural grieving, like for me, passing over the ministry. Mm-hmm. I know there's going to, relationships will change, right? Because my team is really busy yes. and I've been used to interacting with them every day, sometimes multiple times a day, and that's going to change. And so there's grief in that. But then I, there's also, and that, and that's good to find joy in relationships, right? And it's yes. good to find joy in serving Christ. But then I also have to look, okay, what part of my joy came from success or expansion or any of these other things that actually, I think they're going to give me joy, but they actually steal it from me because yes. they hinder my relationship with, with Christ. And so transition periods provide an opportunity if we take them to really investigate ourselves Mm -hmm. and say, God, what are you doing in me right now through this? I think we're called to reflect, called to pause. He wants us to trust in him to bring us from where we are to something else. He's not just going to leave us out there hanging. Right. You know, that that's not his character either. Right. And, And so you're right. We have to say, okay, it isn't about my comfort. It isn't about popularity. It isn't about a job title. It's really about, am I going to press into God and his love? Am I going to rest in it? Because God just wants us. Right. It's not about what I do. It's not about, there's nothing I can do for God. He really doesn't need me. Right. By his lovely grace and love, he lets me be involved with things. And yet what he wants is us. He wants yeah. that heart. Right, right. And I think a, a great way to end this conversation, I wanted to look at actually one man in scripture who began with intimacy with God. Like he had a, a divine calling. He had experienced numerous, what I would call miraculous encounters that revealed to him, God is in this. He's leading me. He's a personal God. He's empowered man. And his name is Saul. He's ancient Israel's first king. And reading through, I recommend to some of the listeners, just read through 1 Samuel 9 to when he was called and just all the ways, like, I mean, it's just mind blowing. And yet he forfeited that and then he lost the kingdom out of disobedience. And I've always wondered afterwards, he... He knew he lost the kingdom. He knew God had was had someone else in mind. And scripture says that numerous times. Like he was afraid of David, ancient Israel's second king, because he knew God was with him. Like, I mean, come on. Right. <laughs> and and so he kept fighting instead of releasing, fighting for what was not his anymore. And he forfeited peace, intimacy with God. He could have probably ended his reign with success. Yes. I mean, and he lost Everything because he wouldn't give up that one thing. He even lost his family. Right. He lost his children. Right. Everything. All of it. Because of his unwillingness to to trust and obey. Right. There's some ancient hymn about that. Sing. No, don't. No, I'm I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to. Not today. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Well, and I think that's just a great reminder. I'm really looking forward in the next episode. So we're kind of leading this where you've left the church. You've yes. left staff. You're, you're Nana. Yes, I'm Nana. You're Nana. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to our next episode when we talk about stepping into the new. Yes. Which is wonderful and scary all at the same time. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you for listening. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to subscribe to this podcast. Then you won't miss a single episode. Share it with your friends. And until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free.